I'm Judy Woodruff on the News Hour tonight. The only people giving a platform to these hate groups is the media itself and the fake news. President Trump sounds off at a raucous rally. Mr. Trump defends his Charlottesville response and aims a blistering broadside at the news media and even fellow Republicans. Then a spotlight on war games. The U.S. military's annual drills with South Korea begin amid heightened tensions with the North. And we listen in as a British rock star, Billy Bragg, explores how a little-known musical genre called skiffle brought us bands like the Beatles. From January 1964 to December 1965, there's a British group at number one in the American charts for 52 weeks out of 104. Every single one of them begins as a skiffle group. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. From the president today, a return to measured tones and a message of unity. This only hours after he sounded off in a full-throated denunciation of those he sees as not sharing his views. John Yang begins our coverage. Addressing the American Legion National Convention today in Reno, Nevada, President Trump largely stayed on message. It is time to heal the wounds that divide us and to seek a new unity based on the common values that unite us. We are one people with one home and one great flag. What a crowd. But at a rally organized and paid for by his reelection campaign in Phoenix Tuesday night, for 77 minutes, it was Mr. Trump unscripted and unfiltered. He mocked critics Trump. of his evolving response to the violence in Charlottesville and defended his words. He didn't say it fast enough. He didn't do it on time. Why did it take a day? He must be a racist. It took a day. I hit him with neo-Nazi. I hit him with everything. I, I got the white supremacists, the neo-Nazi. I got them all in there, let's see. But yeah, KKK, we have KKK. I got them all. But Mr. Trump did not mention what drew critics ire, his previous remarks equating hate groups and those protesting them. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. As the president spoke last night, a leader of the white separatist movement, which calls itself the alt-right, tweeted, Trump has never denounced the alt-right, nor will he. Before the speech, Mr. Trump met with Border Patrol officers along the Mexican border and later declared he will do whatever it takes to achieve a signature campaign promise, even shut down the government. And we are building a wall on the southern border, which is absolutely necessary. Build that wall. Now, the obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it, but believe me, if we have to close down our government, we're building that wall. Today, House leaders in both parties rejected the idea. Speaker Paul Ryan. So I don't think um, anyone's interested in, in having a shutdown. I don't think it's in our interest to do so. I don't think you have to choose between the two. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi accused the president of threatening to cause chaos in the lives of millions of Americans if he doesn't get his way. She said Democrats will stand fast against the immoral, ineffective border wall. The president also said talks on renegotiating NAFTA, which began just last week, are likely headed for failure. Personally, I don't think we can make a deal because we have been so badly taken advantage of. So I think we'll end up probably terminating NAFTA at some point. Okay, probably. And Mr. Trump electrified the crowd by hinting at a presidential pardon for former local sheriff Joe Arpaio. He's awaiting sentencing for defying a federal court order to stop detaining suspected undocumented immigrants. He faces up to six months in jail. So, was Sheriff Joe convicted for doing his job? That's what... I'll make a prediction. I think he's going to be just fine, okay? 
As the president spoke, emotions ran high both inside the arena and on the streets outside where hundreds of protesters gathered. While it was mostly calm, police used tear gas after they said rocks and bottles were thrown at them. Officials reported at least four arrests and no injuries. Mr. Trump's Phoenix performance was reminiscent of last year's campaign, seemingly free of any constraints or inhibitions. And as in last year's campaign, it caused critics to question the president's fitness for office. On I'm CNN, so former so director of national this. intelligence well, James nice Clapper. Uh, I found this uh, uh, downright scary and, and, uh, and disturbing. So there are very little uh, in the way of controls over, uh, you know, exercising a nuclear option, which is uh, pretty damn scary. But Mr. Trump's core supporters loved it, and their applause, cheers, and chants were music to the president's ears. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm John Yang. And we'll have more of what Mr. Trump had to say last night and explore the reaction today after the news summary. In the day's other news, former Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton says Mr. Trump made her skin crawl during a debate last year. She writes about the incident during their second general election face-off. That's in her new book, What Happened? In audio excerpts, which she recorded, Clinton speaks of how candidate Trump followed her around the stage and says it was incredibly uncomfortable. Do you stay calm, keep smiling, and carry on as if he weren't repeatedly invading your space? Or do you turn, look him in the eye, and say loudly and clearly, back up, you creep, get away from me? I know you love to intimidate women, but you can't intimidate me, so back up. The debate took place in St. Louis last October, right after an audio tape had surfaced of Mr. Trump bragging about groping women. The U.S. Navy has relieved the commander of the 7th Fleet after four ship collisions in Asian waters this year. A statement today announced Vice Admiral Joseph O'Coin was removed due to, quote, loss of confidence in his ability to command. He had been scheduled to retire soon. It follows the latest collision between the destroyer John S. McCain and an oil tanker off Singapore. Several American sailors were killed. Several others are still missing. In Yemen, officials say an airstrike by a Saudi Arabia-run coalition force killed as many as 60 people today, including rebels and civilians. It happened just north of the capital, Sana'a. The city is controlled by the Shiite rebels who are backed by Iran. Emergency workers spent the day recovering bodies from the rubble. The Saudis said they're reviewing the incident. The U.S. State Department is defending a decision to cut or delay almost $300 billion in U.S. aid to Egypt over its human rights violations. Cairo today criticized the move as a, quote, misjudgment by the U.S., but activists say dissent is being stifled by the regime. State Department spokeswoman Heather Nauert says the administration believes that withholding aid will lead to change. Egypt has been put essentially on notice with this. Now, as I talk about that money that's been put off to the side, I want to mention that they still did get a billion dollars in fiscal year 2017. So they still got some of their money, but we're withholding part of that money until they can start to come around and adhere to uh, democratic reforms. President Trump's advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was in Cairo today and met with Egypt's president and foreign minister. Pakistan pushed back harder today against pressure from President Trump. He stepped up criticism this week that Pakistan harbors Taliban militants who stage attacks in Afghanistan. Today, the Pakistani foreign minister said in an interview about the Trump administration, quote, they should not make Pakistan a scapegoat for their failures in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Back in this country, federal prosecutors in Las Vegas are trying to regroup after a jury refused on Tuesday to convict four men in a ranch standoff. They were accused of threatening and assaulting federal agents in 2014. Two were acquitted on all charges, two others on most charges. The case grew out of a standoff between rancher Cliven Bundy and federal officers over his refusal to pay grazing fees on public lands. An earlier trial ended in a hung jury. 
Statues of two Confederate generals were shrouded in black today in Charlottesville, Virginia. The city council ordered the monuments to Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson covered. It's to represent mourning for Heather Heyer. She's the young woman who was protesting against white supremacists this month when a car ran her down and killed her. And on Wall Street, stocks pulled back after yesterday's big gains. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 87 points to close at 21,812. The Nasdaq fell 19, and the S&P 500 slipped 8. Still to come on the news hour, I ask a Republican congressman from Texas about the president's threat to shut down the government if Congress doesn't fund a border wall. Eyes on North Korea's reaction as the U.S. and South Korea hold joint military exercises and much more. We return to the president's campaign rally last night and get the perspective of a Republican congressman where the border debate hits home. Representative Will Hurd of Texas serves on the House Homeland Security Committee, as well as the Intelligence and Oversight Committees. Earlier this month, Hurd visited 20 different Dairy Queens for a series of meet and greets with his constituents across his sprawling district. It stretches from San Antonio down to El Paso. That is one third of the entire U.S.-Mexico border. Congressman Hurd, thank you very much for joining us. So 20 Dairy Queens, tell us, so uh, what did your constituents tell you? What was on their minds? Well, what, what was interesting is one of the first questions I got um, asked was about North Korea. Um, I think the, the potential threat of, of nuclear war um, makes people uh, want to ask those questions. Um, we also heard about tax reform as well, and with 820 miles of the border with U.S. and Mexico, um, the smart wall, which is a piece of legislation I've been working on, um, they, they were asking more, more questions about that. So it was one of the things I try to do every year. I've done over 450 public events in the last two and a half years that I've been in Congress, and it's a great way to get the temperature of the people you're supposed to represent. Well, I don't know uh, whether you've had a chance to talk to constituents today, but I do want to ask you about President Trump's comments last night at that rally in Phoenix, uh, where he went after the news media and others said that his remarks in the aftermath of Charlottesville have been misrepresented, that he uh, that he's denounced bigotry, bigotry and he's denounced racism. Uh, he says he's been unequivocal uh, in that regard. Do you think he's been unequivocal in his statements? since Charlottesville? Well, I think the, the changes in some of the positions um, create a doubt about whether the, com the leader of the free world, you know, denounced racism and bigotry. Um, I think he's, he's clarified those statements, um, and, but, but whenever there's any kind of doubt, um, especially when it comes to the, the president of, of the United States, uh, that's unacceptable. And they're, they're in, in, in America today, there's no room for skinheads or KKK or neo-Nazis or anti-Semitism or hatred or bigotry of, of any kind. Well, where do you think he stands on, on, on the issue of racism? Well, I, I think he has clarified the, those, those statements in, in previous comments, but um, again, I think everybody would have been, would have been, ha would, would feel better if those were the statements that came out uh, first and foremost on, on day one. Congressman, I want to turn you to uh, the, the subject that we mentioned a moment ago, and that is the president's statement last night that he very much still wants that border wall built along the U.S.-Mexico border. He said at one point uh, that he's prepared to see the government shut down if the Congress does not vote the funding for that border wall as he envisions it. And I know you have not supported uh, his position on the wall. How do you read what he's saying? Well, I think shutting the government down for $1.5 billion of a concrete structure doesn't make sense. Uh, the GAO did a report recently that showed that it actually costs more money um, when, we sh when, the, when the government was shut down in, in, in 20, I think it was 2013, um, than keeping it open. So I, I think that's a strategy uh, that we shouldn't pursue. And, and to me, the, the alternative is a smart wall. Uh, building a wall from sea to shining sea is the most expensive and least effective way to do border security. It's 2017. We should have secured our border by now. We should have operational control over the 2,000 miles. And the quickest and most effective way to do that right now is with technology. 
in manpower. And this is a fraction of the cost. Um, the, the wall, the, based on the administration numbers, um, per mile is $24.5 million a mile. A smart wall where you use technology, half a million. It's a $24 million difference per mile. Um, it, is, it is 2017, we can deploy sensors that tell the difference between an animal and a person. We can track that person with a drone until we deploy our most important resource, the men and women in Border Patrol. And, what, and, and that's a fraction of the cost uh, of building a concrete structure. And what we have to remember is every mile of the border is different from every other mile. And building a, a, a 30 foot high concrete structure that takes four hours to penetrate in the Chihuahuan Desert is the equivalent of the bridge of nowhere. And if you don't have Border Patrol to respond to threats, on a, a, on a physical structure, then that physical structure is actually not a barrier. And so we should be, we should be smart about this and, and we should be making sure that we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all solution to border security. It was interesting. The president referred only to Democrats opposing uh, his, his uh, support of, the, of that wall last night, but it's clear that you and other Republicans have concerns as well. I do want to ask you, Congressman Hurd, about what the president had to say about the two Republican senators from Arizona last night, the state where he was. He didn't call them out by name, Senator McCain and uh, Senator Flake, but he went after both of them as he has in the past. And we know uh, in the last few days of reporting uh, that he got into a shouting match with the Republican leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, in the last few days. Today, both McConnell and the White House have put out statements saying they're still working together, but clearly there's been some really some bad blood. How do you look on that? Well, one of the things, Judy, I learned as I was crisscrossing my district going to all these Dairy Queens is that people realize there's way more that unites us than divides us. Um, that's that, 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 that is appropriate for our party. That's appropriate for us, all of us as legislators. And I think our time should be spent on talking about those things that unite us as Americans and deliver for the, the American public. And I think that is something that it's a better use of everyone's time. And, and this is gonna further the, the cause of the American people a lot more than focusing on divisions. And do you think the president is talking about unifying Americans enough? I, I, I don't think so. And uh, again, you know, the, the bully pulpit that the president has is, is pretty significant. And I think that one of the things that I, I've learned in, in my two and a half years in, in Congress is the American people want to see us transcend a party label and transcend DNR and actually get things done, deliver to the American people. And I think if we were focused on that, um, we would be seeing a, a lot more folks happy with what's going on in Washington, D.C. Representative Will Hurd of Texas, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be on. So there remains a lot to unpack from the president's expansive speech last night in Phoenix. We turn now to Corinne Jean-Pierre. She's a senior advisor to MoveOn.org, a contributing editor to Bustle, an online women's magazine, and a veteran of the Obama administration. And Matt Schlapp. He's the chairman of the American Conservative Union and former White House political director for President George W. Bush. And it's great to see you both with us again. Thank you very much. Matt, I want to come to you first. Uh, the president is talking unity today in that speech that he gave uh, in Nevada. But last night, yeah. it was a raucous call. He was defending the way he handled Charlottesville. I was just talking to Congressman Hurd about it. His supporters in the audience loved it. But a lot of people who were listening say they were concerned about what they heard. How did you hear it? Yeah, I think that's what's going on in our politics, and it's been going on for, I think, too long. But we're in our corners. You know, the nation is very divided. The left has never been more left, and the right has never been more right. And this president really wasn't elected. At least his core supporters didn't elect him because they wanted to bring peace and unity to the country. They were spoiling for a fight because after eight years of Obama and what they felt being cut out of the system, they wanted to see some advances on the issues they care about. Donald Trump is actually the type of president that his voters asked him to be. And Corrine, what does that mean? 
Well, that's kind of scary in, in that regard, because as president, you're supposed to be a president for all. And, um, and he's being more and more divider in chief. I think what we saw last night was 70 min 77 minutes of woe is me, victimization, the usual Donald Trump. He seemed very detached from reality and also incredibly isolated. And uh, he tried to rewrite history on uh, how he responded to Charlottesville by omitting uh, all si uh, many sides and both sides and uh, saying that very fine people call saying that about the white supremacists. And so it was incredibly disturbing disturbing what we saw yesterday, but it's also not surprising. He was off script and he was speaking from his heart. Judy, well, let's listen. Just one second, sure. Matt. I want you both to listen to just a, a brief part of what the president had to say. This is on the news media. These are sick people. You know the thing I don't understand? You would think, you would think they'd want to make our country great again. And I honestly believe they don't. I honestly believe it. If you want to discover the source of the division in our country, look no further than the fake news and the crooked media. And I don't believe they're going to change, and that's why I do this. If they would change, I would never say it. The only people giving a platform to these hate groups is the media itself and the fake news. Matt, you were saying earlier the president's doing what his supporters elected him to do. Is yes. this part of that? Yeah, absolutely. We've been fighting, conservatives have been fighting with the national media for a long time because they feel like they just don't get a fair shake. If you look at the Harvard study that came out recently on news coverage at all the big networks and the big media outlets, it's skewed way against Trump. It's skewed way to the left. If you look at all the surveys of reporters and who they tend to vote for politically and their political leanings, it skews to the left. It doesn't mean that a Democrat or a left-leaning reporter can't be fair. And I think it's very unfair to say, to talk about the, me the media monolithic monolithically. And he brought that out in his remarks last night, too. But there are places where a conservative, quite honestly, just can't get a fair shake. This is not one of those, but there are places where they can't. And this is a 50-year battle that conservatives have had in this country. How does this advance the president's agenda? It doesn't at all. And from what I can remember, uh, the white supremacists that were marching in Charlottesville, they weren't pledging their allegiance to New York Times or uh, uh, or CNN. They were pledging their, their allegiance to Donald Trump. Some of them were, were saluting to the Nazi flag in his name. And so the, the fake news is coming from Donald Trump or, or we are we are essentially following everything that he is saying. So we're not making this up. These are his words. All we have to do is play back the tapes. The other thing I want to ask you both about is, and this is quickly just listen to another excerpt of what the president had to say last night about fellow Republicans. Obamacare is a disaster. And think... Think, we were just one vote away from victory after seven years of everybody proclaiming repeal and replace one vote away. One, one vote. One vote away. And nobody wants me to talk about your other senator who's weak on borders weak on crime, so I won't talk about him. Nobody wants me to talk about him. Nobody knows who the hell he is. So, Matt, of course, the president's referring to Arizona's two senators, right. uh, Jeff Flake, who he was just talking about, and Senator John McCain, that right. one vote on health care, who, by the way, is undergoing a chemotherapy right now for cancer. Yeah, hashtag indisputable. One vote away. And think about it. Two of those votes, both Senator Murkowski and Senator John McCain, went around this country. John McCain featured it in his television ads that he would lead the charge to repeal and replace Obamacare. And it's worse than what the president said. There's actually six Republican senators who switched their vote on a copycat vote. In 2015, they voted to repeal Obamacare, knowing Obama would veto it. This time, they didn't vote that way because they knew it would become law. 
Why did they go around this country for seven and a half years saying they would vote to repeal it? But my curious, my, what I'm curious about, Corrine, is how does this help the president to be going after members of his own party? It doesn't at all. When uh, when Congress, but you comes kind of back, enjoy it, don't you? Uh, hey, it's, okay. it's it's great. I have popcorn for days uh, to watch all of this madness. But when he, when Congress comes back in September, Donald Trump's going to be a very lonely person. And the reason why Obamacare failed uh, to be repealed and it's it's still the uh, uh, law today is because. It, Trump care was so unpopular. The only thing more unpopular than Donald Trump was Trump this care. Is, this is. And remember, he only needed 50 votes, not 60. That's right. 50, and they couldn't get. And we have 52 number. Republican senators. This is a fight my party has to have. If we won't push aggressively for our agenda, our supporters start to wonder why they put Republicans in at all. So does that uh, justify or explain the president's what was reported to be uh, this shouting mash, angry uh, conversation okay, so between <laughs> Mitch McConnell? Having we both served in different yes. White House administrations, but I cannot tell you how many times word spread when uh, the president, the vice president, or someone senior in his staff had harsh words with someone on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. You're saying and this has happened before? It happens all the time. Remember Trent Lott? Uh, you know there was all that oh, yeah. controversy. So yeah, this yeah. is not uncommon. The only the difference in the Trump era, which I don't like, is that these spats tend to wind up uh, in the pages of magazines and newspapers. I wish there was a little more discretion. I don't know who's who's guilty on that front, but the White House has been leaking a lot uh, previous to General Kelly. But it does raise a question again, Kareen, is this president going to get done what he wants to get done, whether it's, I'm going to say it for Matt, tax reform, infrastructure, That's right. work, uh, you Healthcare. name it. Healthcare. Healthcare. Oh, oh gosh. Is this, is this going to advance? I that. think it just makes it very difficult for him. But I have to say, Republicans have been enabling him. I think even though there was the spat, if you will, um, that was reported in the in the paper last night, they are still going to be lockstep with Donald Trump. I, I don't see any scenario where they are not. We need to have this fight. We need to learn as a party that I give you guys great credit in the Obama administration. You got the agenda through, even when you couldn't get it through Congress, by hook or by crook, by phone, by pen, you got it in. Republicans, we are so much more timid. We're so afraid we're going to rankle people. It's why we turn to Trump. We're tired of that because it doesn't, would, it doesn't, it doesn't end up in results. They want to see results. Maybe this won't work, but maybe it's our only way to actually get things done. But nothing the, timid about sorry, this president. Really quickly, but you guys, they, they obstructed for eight years and they were very successful. There was a reason why we have a That's, Justice Gorsuch and not a the American Gorsuch people gave Republicans. Republicans majority and they acted in that way. We're good at obstructing. Let's see if we can actually govern. Well, that you haven't been able to do that. So. Matt I agree Clapp. with you. Corrine <laughs> Jean-Pierre, we'll have you back to continue this. Thank you both. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> Stay with us. Coming up on the News Hour, how one man was wrongly blamed for the attack in Charlottesville. Allegations that Exxon misled the public about climate change. And Billy Bragg reflects on the music that influenced his own unique blend of rock and folk. But first, war games in Korea. For decades, the U.S. and South Korea have conducted military exercises, often involving tens of thousands of troops and massive firepower. The U.S. says they're designed to enhance readiness and maintain stability. The drills that started Monday and will continue into next week don't look particularly threatening, but some Korea watchers are calling them provocative. News Hour special correspondent Nick Schifrin has this report. As visuals go, this is as provocative as this month's U.S.-South Korea exercises get. Four men with 15 stars in front of a Patriot missile defense system in South Korea. We have had the responsibility of providing military options to our national leaders. And exercises are our way of making sure that the option is a ready option. It's a capable option. General Vincent Brooks is the U.S.'s top commander in South Korea. He's leading exercises that are almost entirely computer simulations, as seen here in the 2013 version. It doesn't look like much, but the exercises allow the U.S. and South Korean militaries to test their communication in case of war. Being in readiness to fight tonight if we have to is what we'll do. But exercises the U.S. calls defensive, North Korea calls provocative. 
Today, state TV showed a smiling Kim Jong-un ordering the production of more rocket warheads and engines, and a not-so-subtle hint on the poster that North Korea is developing a new missile design. North Korea said the exercises were driving the peninsula to war and vowed to respond. U.S. warmongers ignored our warning that they should act cautiously and instead made a dangerous military provocation. They will not be able to avoid merciless retaliation and unsparing punishment. To say that these defensive deterrence exercises are the cause of North Korea's insecurity, simply have it backwards. Balbina Huang is a visiting Georgetown professor and former senior State Department advisor on North Korea. She points out in the last few years, the North Koreans have dramatically increased their missile tests and missile capacities, and it's those tests that make U.S. preparedness crucial. It is very important for the U.N. forces, U.S. and South Korea, to be able to maintain constantly modern, capable defense and deterrence. That is the purpose of the exercise. But the U.S. and South Korea also conduct annual exercises with massive number of forces and massive amounts of live fire. These are held every spring, and when considered alongside this month's exercises, the U.S. should acknowledge North Korean anxieties are legitimate, argues Mansfield Foundation President Frank Januzzi. Every time that we are practicing, whether it's field exercises or even a tabletop exercise, they get a little bit nervous about what we might do. They also worry about the capabilities that we're demonstrating. And in this particular exercise in the past, we have sometimes demonstrated a capability to uh, launch a decapitation attack, uh, attacking the North Korean leadership. Januzzi participated in 2004 talks that froze and dismantled North Korea's nuclear program in exchange for economic assistance. He was a State Department and congressional North Korea policy analyst. He believes these exercises contribute to increased tensions and that the U.S. should change them to send a signal. Deterrence can be bolstered without uh, flexing our muscles with B-52 bombers or B-2 bombers, nuclear-capable strike aircraft that could annihilate North Korea. Uh, we don't necessarily need to practice uh, those martial arts. Over the last few weeks, some of the tension has cooled. Last night, President Trump even praised Kim Jong-un. I believe he is starting to respect us. I respect that fact very much. Respect that fact. And maybe, probably not, but maybe something positive can come about. And North Korea, despite fiery rhetoric, has indicated it doesn't want increased conflict. All this talk and rhetoric about you know, shooting missiles and sea of fire and nuclear war, that's talk, but what were the actual actions? We do not see any particular um, increase in North Korean military readiness for war. We don't see any sort of major maneuvering uh, that would indicate that North Korea is ready to launch any kind of um, major conventional or military strike. A close reading of North Korea's statements has uh, provided uh, signals to the United States that, in fact, they are open to negotiations. Uh, they're willing to sit down and talk with us. We need to test them and we need to explore what, if anything, is possible through those talks. And those commanders leading this month's exercise, including Admiral Harry Harris, say they hope their readiness creates room for diplomacy. Credible combat power should be and support of diplomacy and not the other way around. So the U.S. exercises and the North Korean rhetoric will continue. But from all indications, both sides hope the preparations for war and the threats of war don't lead to war. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin. Now, a personal take on the aftermath of the violence in Charlottesville. Former Foreign Service officer and Democratic campaign aide Brennan Gilmore was there to join the counter protests against a Unite the Right rally. He witnessed the car plow into a crowd of protesters, killing Heather Heyer and injuring 19 others. He was taking a video that captured the incident. He made it public, did some news media interviews, and then came death threats and conspiracy theories. Brennan Gilmore joins me now. Thank you for being here. Thank so, Brennan, tell us again, why, why did you want to be part of this protest? 
Well, I thought it was very important uh, to be there as a show of numbers uh, against these white supremacists. I think any time you have this uh, very vile ideology show its face in our country, you need to have the majority of people who reject it uh, show up and, and show that the, the numbers are on our side. And so that's what took me to Charlottesville that day. And you were saying this is close to your hometown. Yes, I live in Charlottesville now. So what exactly did you witness? Well, the day, uh, as soon as I got there and early in the morning, it had already become quite tense, and there were fights breaking out between counter-protesters and, uh, and the white supremacists in the, in the park. Um, that became pretty violent pretty quickly, you know, a lot of fist fights, uh, things that were thrown, water bottles. On both bottles. sides. Uh, yes, and this was, this was happening between both sides. Uh, shortly thereafter, the state of emergency was declared, so that central location of the protest was broken up by a pretty overwhelming police presence. Uh, and then these groups split apart and moved elsewhere in Charlotte. And the situation became quite dangerous as, as these groups, uh, you know, were, were, were wandering the streets. And so, not long after, uh, I found myself on a side street, 4th Street in Charlottesville, with a couple of friends, and I witnessed a, uh, a, a crowd of counter-protesters, of anti-racist -rac protesters, coming up 4th Street. Uh, and I began to film their march. And they were in, you know, a celebratory mood, thinking that after the state of emergency, these white supremacists and Nazi groups had been banished from, from Charlottesville. Uh, I began filming when, from behind me, I heard a, a vehicle accelerating very quickly. I turned and saw uh, the vehicle in question come down 4th Street at a very high rate of speed. Uh, it went over a, a median area and then barreled into the crowd, uh, sending bodies flying everywhere. You were there. You attended, I think, to some of the injured. Then you quickly posted this online. And then within a day or so, what happened? That's correct. I, well, I immediately gave the video to police because I realized that I had evidence, uh, and then and then took a little while to determine the the benefits of posting it online. I, I did make a decision to do so, uh, and basically within 24, 36 hours, uh, I received a phone call from my sister, uh, who had been monitoring, um, you know, my presence on, on the internet and in media, and she said, um, Brennan, I've I've found this, uh, you know, alt right Nazi message board, and they've published uh, our parents' home address, uh, and there's death threats uh, towards you. And they're suggesting that you are somehow involved uh, in the attack, uh, either as an orchestrator or somehow uh, played a role, uh, and that you weren't just there to film it, but you were actually there to, uh, as part of the arrangement. Some of these threats were pretty graphic, but what I mean, what were the, what were the kinds of things they were saying? Oh, you, you know, you're a dead man walking. You're a, a CIA operative. You work for George Soros or Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, and you know, we're coming for you. We know where you are. Uh, you know, you're going to burn in hell. Uh, any sort of uh, a litany of, of of accusations and threats that I you know can't discuss on on television. Uh, but they came in on on Twitter, uh, via Facebook, um, and posted on these message boards uh, at a at a pretty alarming rate. There were there were reports. I know on the uh, the very the far right uh, uh, site called Infowars. The, the yes, that's correct. Within you know a couple days, uh, I you know these these conspiracy these conspiracy theories started on some rather uh, bizarre sites that sort of twisted my my former service uh, with the State Department into accusations that I had caused genocide in Africa uh, and some just ridiculously unbelievable things. Um, but yes, by by a couple days after the incident, it was on Infowars with a, an hour long special about how the whole thing in Charlottesville was a Soros plot to destabilize the country. George Soros being the wealthy... Uh, Correct. Uh, the uh, billionaire man. hedge fund manager. Yep. Right. And, uh, and that I had played a key role uh, as an operative and, 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 you know, that this, my role in it helped expose the truth. Is there anything about what you did or how you got involved, Brennan, that could have been interpreted as part of organizing this, making it happen? Uh, well, I think what uh, what triggered a lot of people was my background with the federal government and with uh, you know Democrat uh, Democratic politics. I had uh, worked as chief of staff to Tom Periello, who had run for governor of Virginia, and I'd spent many years uh, in the State Department. And for uh, you know some people, they they think that that equates to some sort of uh, a, um, you know so it's a sort of spy work. But I was very proud of my Foreign Service career and what I did overseas. It had nothing to do with that. Um, but you know, for people that are used to watching movies and things, it, it, and the truth is, um, is less, uh, less, less relevant than, uh, than the ideas that they have in their mind. You were telling us just before this that this has died down a little, some of the threats and so forth. It's still out there. How are you dealing with it personally? 
Well, yeah, I mean, if anything, it's emboldened me to speak even more. Uh, you know, the, the threats have come in and they're, you know, this is a tactic from the alt-right to try and intimidate people into not calling things as they see them and to not talk about the truth of, of a very, very difficult situation for our country, and that is the resurgence of a violent ideology of white supremacy. Um, so, you know, if anything, it's, it's, it's convinced me to be even louder in condemning this, and the, the reason I went to Charlottesville in the first place uh, was to stand up against it. And so, you know, certainly I was taken aback and, and, and worried for my family's safety, um, but, you know, they've, they've also been incredibly uh, insistent that I continue to speak out and use this platform, which I came by in a very un uh, unfortunate way, uh, to push back against something that can, you know, do a lot of damage to us. What would you say you've learned from this experience? The broader question here is, you know, how, how dangerous this ideology is for our country, what we saw in Charlottesville. And this is what I've seen overseas as well. I worked in a lot of conflict areas in Africa where you've seen these very destructive forces of tribalism, of racism be manipulated and instrumentalized by political leaders. Uh, and they're forces that once they are sort of, once the Pandora's box of racism is opened up, uh, it can spiral out of control very, very quickly. And so I think, you know, it's imperative that political leaders on all sides condemn this and say, you know, here's the bounds of what's acceptable in our political discourse in the United States. And we draw a very firm line and absolutely exile the idea of an ideology, white supremacy, which by its very nature is violence, which in a necessitates, you know, removing certain classes or, or races of citizens. And we've some, seen some leaders do this, but, but, but not enough. Well, it's clearly something that I think that many people thought couldn't happen in the United States, but here it is. Absolutely. Um, I think yeah, it can happen anywhere, and it's incredibly destructive when it rears its head. It, need, it belongs in the dustbin of history. Brennan Gilmore, thank you very much. Thank you. ExxonMobil has long been criticized for allegedly hiding what it knew about climate change. Just today, a pair of researchers say that Exxon's own documents prove that is true. William Brangham has more. It's in our weekly series on the leading edge of science. Thanks, Judy. Those two researchers who are from Harvard University, they published a study today alleging that ExxonMobil tried to systematically mislead the public about climate change for 40 years. The researchers began this study after the energy company challenged critics to compare Exxon's own peer-reviewed scientific research on climate change against what the company publicly said about that science. Our science correspondent, Miles O'Brien, joins us from Detroit with more on this. So, Miles, tell us, uh, what was the scope of this particular study? Well, William, we're talking about a systematic scientific content analysis, 187 internal and external corporate documents produced by ExxonMobil, 1977 through 2014. Now, during that time, the oil giant was funding a lot of rigorous studies on climate change. They were published in scientific journals not easily accessible or digestible to the public. 83 percent of these peer-reviewed studies match the scientific consensus that climate change is real, caused by humans, largely, and is an existential concern. But the study concludes ExxonMobil offered the general public something else, a diametrically opposed stance on climate science. Now, to assess ExxonMobil's public statements, the researchers went through the so-called advertorials that the company purchased on the op-ed page of The New York Times every Thursday for 30 years. And it was almost the same proportion, 81 percent of those statements, but on the other side of the coin, a completely divergent view. It cast doubt on whether climate change was real, it discounted human impacts, and they suggested there was nothing practical to do about it anyway. The study co-author, Jeffrey Supran, is a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard. What we found when we've read these documents is um, a clear, unmistakable, systematic discrepancy between, on the one hand, what ExxonMobil said and discussed about climate change in private and in academic circles, and on the other hand, what it said about climate change to the general public, uh, no less than in the New York Times. So, Miles, this whole research effort basically came out of a dare that ExxonMobil made, saying, take a look at our documents. Explain what happened there. Yes, William, this was an attempt to call a bluff, I think. ExxonMobil authored a blog two years ago daring its critics to analyze its publicly available documents on climate science. They said, read all of these documents, make up your own mind. 
The challenge came in the wake of some great investigative reporting by Inside Climate News, and it found ExxonMobil years ago acknowledged climate change privately is caused by humans and is a serious problem, but it did not acknowledge it publicly. The study co-author, Naomi Oreskes, is a professor of history of science at Harvard. We see a picture where the company is aware of the evolving science and saying things that pretty much any climate scientist who would have been working at the time would have basically agreed with, more or, more or less. Um, but in contrast, when ExxonMobil turned to the public and published advertorials, there we see a very different picture. There we see a very consistent picture of emphasizing doubt, implying that we don't really know, that the science is unsettled, and therefore um, it's either too soon to act or it would be too expensive to act or the problem is too difficult to solve. Miles, does the paper point out any specific examples that the authors say prove their conclusion about Exxon? Well, William, there's one that really stands out. In 1985, an Exxon scientist co-authored a study that was really prescient. He predicted that uh, global climate at the surface would uh, increase by two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And this was way before the United Nations scientists uh, came to that conclusion. And yet, 15 years after that study was released, in The New York Times, Exxon released an advertorial saying unsettled science was the rule of the day, and it quoted data from other studies which seemed to suggest it was natural fluctuations. Uh, the authors of that study said it was extremely misleading. We have messages like this about unsettled science read by probably millions of people, and in contrast, decent climate science by Exxon's own scientists hidden away in peer-reviewed articles um, in you know, scientific journals. And so the discrepancy is not just in the message being communicated. Miles, what has Exxon said about this report? Well, we called ExxonMobil. We asked them to respond on camera to the Harvard study. They declined, but they did offer us a written statement. In part, it reads, uh, the study was paid for, written, and published by activists, leading a five-year campaign against the company. It is inaccurate and preposterous. Our statements have been consistent with our understanding of climate science. Rather than pursuing solutions to address the risk of climate change, these activists, along with trial lawyers, have acknowledged a goal of extracting money from our shareholders and attacking the company's reputation. Naomi Oreskes says she is not ashamed to be called an activist, because she considers herself to be both an activist and a scholar, and she doesn't see those two things as contradictory, William. Uh, Miles, does Exxon offer any examples that contradict this study? They do offer two examples from the year 2000, two op-ed pieces which seem to embrace the overall scientific consensus. Uh, but that's all they offer specifically. Obviously, this is coming in the midst of Exxon fighting all of these other legal battles about its messaging about climate change. How is this study going to impact any of that? Well. Exxon is indeed fighting off a lot of legal challenges right now. Shareholders have sued the company, claiming its public statements uh, dismissing the risks of climate change were materially false and misleading. A class action suit filed by Exxon employees claims the company overstated the value of its assets, driven in part by its failure to acknowledge the impact of climate change on the value of its reserves. Attorneys general in New York and Massachusetts are probing whether Exxon lied to investors, as is the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, Jeffrey Supron and Naomi Oreskes say they're not making judgments on specific legal issues, but it is highly likely this scientific take on the politics of climate change will be injected into the legal process, William. All right. As always, Mel's O'Brien, thank you so much. You're welcome, William. Finally, a British rock star with a new take on the birth of rock and roll. Jeffrey Brown has the story. He's back in fashion. Billy Bragg first rose to fame as a punk rock and folk musician in the early 1980s. And the sleep of reason produces monsters. Now nearing 60, he's still singing hard edged songs of protest and passion. Here recently at the Birchmere Music Hall in Alexandria, Virginia. Kids are all right, getting life.
license to all this hate. In a new book, Roots, Radicals, and Rockers, he's also looking back to an even earlier, lesser known, but important moment in music history. I'm a gambling man, I'm a gambling man. When a pop star named Lonnie Donegan and others took Britain by storm in the mid-1950s with a phenomenon called skiffle music. What Donegan does, he's the first British artist to get in the charts playing a guitar, and he begins the process of turning it into a guitar-led, yeah. British pop into a guitar-led music for teenagers. As the guitar becomes a kind of way that our um, youngsters express the fact that they're different from their parents. As the guitar becomes the, the way that they start to try and make the future happen. On the rock on the line, it's a mighty good road. They did it, though, by listening to the past, to Skiffle's roots in African-American culture, including traditional New Orleans jazz and the great American folk and blues musician Huddy Ledbetter, known as Leadbelly. Lonnie Donegan had a hit in 1956 with Leadbelly's Rock Island Line. And British kids picked up cheap acoustic guitars, homemade tea chest basses, and washboards to play something akin to American jug band or rockabilly music. Bragg says it was a turning point for British culture, still coming out of its post-war depths. Just a month before Lonnie Donegan records Rock Island Lion, food rationing ends in the UK. It goes on after the Second World War because we have a huge uh, balance of payments problem. Some things are rationed after the war that are never rationed during the war. Bread, for instance, was rationed for a short while after the war. So the kids who are playing skiffle have grown up not being able to go into a sweet shop and buy whatever they want. All of a sudden, they're 14, 15, 16, they're leaving school, they're going to work, they're getting paid reasonably well in the post-war uh, boom, and they, they want something that identifies them as, as different, and skiffle becomes that thing for the young men. Among those young men, 14-year-old James Page, here on the BBC with his skiffle band. Do you play anything except skiffle? Yes, Spanish and dance. Do you? Well. Jimmy Page would later become one of rock's biggest stars as the guitarist for Led Zeppelin. And he was hardly the only rocker to start out in skiffle. Well, Van Morrison was 12. You know, George Harrison was 13 when he saw Donegan, McCartney 14, Lennon 16. Those, so, are, those are big names later yeah, on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teenagers, when they saw that, they knew that this was the future and that, that, that they needed to get older one of those guitars. I mean, sales from, of guitars went, acoustic guitars, this is, went from 5,000 in one year, two, three years later, to 250,000 mm. guitars in a year. And they're all playing in, you know, they're not doing, they're not, there's not a scene. Yeah. They're playing in back rooms and, and, you know, church halls, but it's what they do subsequently, when they're 20, 25, that really makes a difference. John Lennon and Paul McCartney's first group, the Quarrymen, started as a skiffle band. The rest, as they say, is history. 3,000 screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. As young British musicians plugged in, threw out the old-timey skiffle sounds to create their own, and brought that back across the Atlantic in the British invasion. From January 1964 to December 1965, there's a British group at number one in the American charts for 52 weeks out of 104. Every single one of them begins as a skiffle group. The only exception is Petula Clark, and she didn't need Lonnie Donegan to operate. She'd already put out 12 singles before skiffle started, but everybody else, Chad and Jeremy, the Rolling Stones, uh, the Tremolos, the Animals, all have their roots in skiffle. Skiffle liberates those bands to, to uh, get out there and play music at such a young age that when the Beatles break the charts in America in, in January 64, there's a whole cohort of British bands who have been playing for years who are, who are ready to go. And it takes, it takes American youth a little longer to catch up. Skiffle gave them the, the means, the, the something to get up with a guitar. It's the sense of empowerment that came with Skiffle to very young people, to make them think they can make their own music, to not wait for someone else to, to make it. That's a very similar impulse to punk rock. And I think that's what drove the Beatles and all those other bands to write their own material. Thought I heard that Casey when she For his part, Billy Bragg has continued to write his own songs while also working within traditions of the past. His most recent album, Shine a Light, with the American singer-songwriter Joe Henry, was largely recorded in railway stations around the U.S. Now the rich man took my home. And at the Birchmere concert, Bragg offered a beautiful version of a Woody Guthrie song. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. 
But when I asked about his own coming-of-age skiffle-style moment, he turned to his punk rock roots. The Clash. The Clash. More or less, yeah, yeah. I saw The Clash when I was 19. Um, uh, me and some friends of mine have been really interested in uh, bands like Dr. Feelgood and The Jam, who were stripping it back. And uh, we went to see The Clash at the Rainbow mm -hmm. in 1978. And it, it seemed to... It's, it's one of those watershed moments. It's like the, when the Skifflers heard Donegan. It's that, you know, that sort of uh, ability to make your own culture that came with punk rock that really it keeps me going. That's why I thought I could sit down and write a book about Skiffle rather than wait for someone to ask me. Let's break it down and start again. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown from the Birchmere Music Hall in Alexandria, Virginia. Let's stop pretending that we can manage our way out of here. Let's stop and we thought we knew all about rock and roll. So that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. For all of us, the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're watching PBS.